Hey there, listeners, and welcome to a brand new episode of Deeply Rooted. I'm Jeremiah Reiner, your host, as always, and we so appreciate you guys tuning in for another episode. This is episode 91, actually, and this is going to round out our three-part series looking at really what we would call the Christmas story out of Luke chapter 2, and we're going to pick up in verse 15 momentarily from a message that I preached previously at our home church of Calvary Bible Church in Duffield, Virginia. Don't forget, if you haven't done so, and if you're a long-time listener, you know the routine here, head on over to our YouTube channel and on Apple Podcast. Hit that subscribe button, and please leave us a review. We would love to hear back from you, and that feedback also helps us in getting out more of our information and our ministry here to other listeners. It also helps other people hear about Deeply Rooted, so we would appreciate any kind of feedback we would get from you guys on those platforms. You can also head on over to our Facebook group page and join us there at Deeply Rooted as well. And if you haven't done so, head on over to our website at deeplyrootedpodcast.com. You'll find blog posts on there. You're going to also find all of our archived episodes, and you're going to find some upcoming ministry schedule as well if you'd like to be in the area where we're at and be a part of some, uh, some of the opportunities that we have coming up. Now, having said all that, this is actually going to be our last episode of 2021, so we really appreciate all those that have listened, that have helped out, that have supported, prayed, everything that you could literally possibly do to help out Deeply Rooted. We appreciate you all so much, and we're grateful for you, and we're looking forward to 2022, Lord willing. We've got a lot of good things coming up. We've got three major episodes ahead of us in January that we're going to be looking at that were based off of our poll question that we ran on our group page there on Facebook. So we're excited about those things. We're going to be into uh, some more pastor profile episodes as well coming up this year. And around the corner, we should be hitting episode 100 pretty soon, too. So lots of fun things to talk about there as we get into it. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get you guys plugged into the message out of Luke chapter 2, verses 15 through 21. We hope you enjoy. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 15. We'll go down to verse 21, and then I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. So Luke chapter 2, beginning... In verse 15, Scripture says, And when the angels went away from them into heaven, shepherds said one to another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they made haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told of them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary treasured up these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, and it had been told to them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we love you and honor your name. We thank you for your word today. We thank you for a time together to gather and worship. Lord, we thank you for this place that you've anointed for us to be here today. We thank you for all the provisions that you've made. Lord, we're grateful for it. God, I pray as we open up your word, we also do it with open hearts and open minds, that we receive what you have for us and that we take it and obey it and apply it to our lives. God, I pray that we would use this to help season us, be more salt and light into this world that desperately needs it. I pray, God, that we would ascribe worth to your name today through the preached word. I pray that what we've said and done here today and what we're going to say and do would be pleasing to you and that, Lord, we would be in obedience according to your word. I thank you for this opportunity to preach. I pray that you would use me and hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ as a simple messenger. And God, I pray that you receive the honor and glory due to your name. We pray that in that great name, King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. And amen. John Wesley Works is a gentleman I was reading about the other day. He spent most of his life growing up very well educated. He lived most of his life in Nashville, and he grew up under the dad who was a choir director there at their local church. Music was always important to him, but he went on later in his life to get a master's degree in Latin, and he became a teacher, and he actually taught Greek and Latin for most of his life. But what he's mainly known for is putting together and compiling a couple of books that were essentially hymn books. The first one that he put together was in 1901. It was called New Jubilee Songs 
as sung by the Fisk Jubilee Singers. But the second work is probably what he's most known for, specifically for one song that he found in there. Works Jr. being an African American was extremely indebted to what had happened before his time, and so he had dug up a lot of what we would call African spirituals. At this time, you'd have to understand most of African history is oral tradition, so it's a little tough to pin down who wrote and corresponded and actually pieced together the music, but he got one specifically that was published in that second volume, and it's very famous to us today. It's become somewhat of a, a Christmas song, so to speak, but it's about this account here in Luke chapter 2. We used to sing it a lot when I was kids. It's called Go and Tell It on the Mountain. You've probably heard that song before. Works Jr. is somewhat given credit for coming up with it, although he cannot take credit for writing it. He did compose a little bit of the music for it there. But my question to that, and has always been, as it corresponds here in Luke 2, is what is it that we're supposed to go and tell on the mountain? What is it that the angels gave to these shepherds here? What is it that they spoke to Mary and Elizabeth about as we've covered the text already? And the question is posed here, and that's what I want to preach on this morning. I want to go tell it on the mountain and the valley and the deserts and the lakes and the streams and the rivers and every other place that you can find to go tell it. But if you don't know what it is, it's really hard to figure out what the point of the text is. It is the same thing it's always been in the beginning of Luke, and it is the Word of God. That is what we go tell people on the mountain. That is what we go tell people in the entire world. Jesus said for us to go into all the world and preach and teach this gospel. He told you what it was. The angels have told the shepherds here what it was, and we want to look at it here this morning. How do we go and tell it? I think there's actually a, a, a prescription here for us, I think, in the text. Look in verses 15 with me. When the angels went away from them, referring to the shepherds, into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing which has happened, here it is, which the Lord has made known to us. How did He do that? Through the angels. Verse 16, and they went how? Begrudgingly, like most Christians go to church? No, they went with haste. And it says here that they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, by the way, just as the angel had told them. Here's the first point to look at. If you're going to go tell anything, you better have a revelation of it. You can't preach or teach anything that you don't have. It would be the equivalent of you wanting to be generous and being empty-handed. That's a nice gesture, but friend, you can't give what you don't have. You can't preach what you don't have. If God has not revealed it to you, you don't have anything to say. You have opinions. You have preferences. I'm going to help you out on that. So does every other person in the world. That doesn't do you any good in heaven. Having an opinion, having advice from somebody, having preferences, having just some lingo that somebody has told you does you no good because you have nothing of value. The angels did not come with preferences and opinions. The angels came with what? The Lord has made known to us. This is essential if we're going to go tell anybody anything on the mountain or wherever you want to tell it to them. You can't give what you don't have. And the question is very simple. Who was it revealed by? Verse 15 literally tells us, which the Lord made known to us. Who is us? Well, it's the shepherds, but you've got to dive a little deeper. We know more than this. Luke is not the only one that wrote about this conception of the Lord. We know that in Matthew chapter 2, Matthew tells us that later on, not only did shepherds come to see the Lord, but who else came? Wise men came. Kings from far off in the east. I find that a great comparison because who did God give this revelation to? Everybody. Shepherds are poor. Wise men are rich. Shepherds are unknown. These wise men were famous. Shepherds are close by. The wise men came from far off. 
Shepherds are peasants. Wise men are rulers. Shepherds are powerless. Wise men are powerful. Shepherds are uneducated. Wise men get the name honestly. They were extremely educated. But here's the main point. Shepherds are Jews. Wise men are Gentiles. So who was this revelation for? Who's the Word of the Lord for? Everybody. Everybody. You need to hear the Word of the Lord. Shepherds, wise men, peasants, kings, rulers, male, female, young, old, Middle East, Far East, or not from the East. It doesn't matter. You need to hear the Word of the Lord. And look what happened, the proper response in verse 16. When the Word is revealed to anybody, if you want to really know that they heard it, as Jesus said, if you have ears to hear, what always happened when the Word of the Lord was revealed to somebody, verse 16, and they went with haste. They didn't need a second opinion because nobody else's opinion mattered now. God has spoken. That's it. We have lost a generation of people in this world that have forgotten, thus saith the Lord. They want a pastor's opinion. Hey, listen, I'm a preacher, and I will bow the knee to Jesus like everybody else will. You don't need my advice. You need a word from the Lord. You need revelation from heaven. You don't need some fancy speaker, some big conference, some big to-do. You don't need a big scene. These men are in the middle of a field at night. God spoke, and that's all they needed to hear. Verse 16 says, they made what? Haste. That means they hurried to get down there. Here's my question. Don't we do this? Do we make haste when we hear from the Lord? Or if you're like me sometimes, you want to pray about it. As if somehow you can pray God's Word out of your life. Or if the Lord is going to change His mind somehow. How many times have we heard from the Lord and instead of making haste, what do we do? We just sit on our hands. And we hope that God will change His mind. I hope that's not what He's really asking of me. I hope that's not who He really wants me to go talk to. I hope that's not really what He's commanded. I hope I really don't have to forgive that person. The Lord has not changed His mind. Scripture says He's not slack concerning His promises. It means God's not drawing back on what He said. You know why? Because when He says it, it's as good as done. It's truth. It's revelation. Sometimes I think that we treat a word from the Lord kind of like we treat movie trailers. I have a friend. He's always sending me stuff. We talk movies all the time. He says, have you seen this? This is coming out. This, that, and the other. I mean, it's constant. We're back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I used to work at a video store. That was my first job I ever had, back when people actually rented things. They would show up to a place. There was no streaming. There was no Netflix. There was my ugly mug inside of a building, and you had to rent off of me for a few nights. And I say that because all we played on a loop over the TVs in that store were trailers. And why would we do that? Why would we show you movie trailers? We wanted you to consider whether or not you liked it. I love you, and I'm going to say it to you this way. God's not looking for your opinion. God doesn't run movie trailers out of heaven. God speaks, and it is. And that's it. We sometimes, I'm afraid, treat the Word of the Lord like a movie trailer. Well, I sort of liked it. But let me have another verse. That church is okay, but I think I'll find somewhere else. That music was all right, but I think this is a little better. I like that program, but I think we could do it this way also. That verse is tough, but, you know, I prefer something a little lighter. God doesn't run movie trailers out of heaven. There is a revelation of the Word of God, and the proper response to it is haste. Listen, when the Lord tells you to forgive people who've done you wrong, that's not to be debated. He said, that's really hard. He didn't ask you if it was easy or hard. How do you think He felt forgiving you when He sacrificed His Son on a cross, naked, bleeding, in shame, beaten, become sin for us? Who in the world are we to define what is and is not acceptable according to the Word of God? When God tells you to love people that are unlovable, that's not up for debate either. When God tells us to gather, 
Not forsaking the assemblings of ourselves together as some do. That's not up for debate. We gather. We fellowship. Why? The Word of God says so. When the Lord tells us to pray always, that's not up for some kind of, well, let's see if I feel like it today and if I don't feel like it today. Jesus said men ought always to pray. When there's a revelation, we make haste to it. But notice what verse 19 goes on to say. Excuse me, verse 17. He says this, And when they saw it, that's referring to the scene. Here they are. They've came to Mary and Joseph. There's the baby again. What a sight. I want you to think on that for a moment. They've spent their entire life hearing that a great king would come. And all they see is a child wrapped in rags in a feeding trough. It says here, and when they saw it, they what? They didn't get disappointed. They said, oh, it could have been better. They made known the saying that had been told them concerning what? The child. What was the whole point of the word from the angels from God? Your feelings, your happiness, your pleasure, your livelihood, the child. The theme of all of Scripture is Christ. Genesis, Revelation, it all points to Christ. The theme of all of the Word of God is this child. They went out and made known what? Jesus. That's what they made known. Verse 18 says, And all who heard it, now we don't know who these people were, but they ran somewhere and told a group of people about Christ. And when they heard it, notice, they wondered at what the shepherds had told them. They didn't dismiss it. They didn't flog these men, did they? They didn't take them out. They didn't arrest them. They were arrested spiritually. Think about that. They wondered. It means they, it, it literally came over them to ponder on it. <laughs> And that's the second point. Not only do you have a revelation of it, but the second thing you do when you get a revelation from the Lord or the Word of God, you have to preach it. What good would it do to know the Lord and know the things of the Lord and not tell other people? You know what we call that? Selfishness. You know what God is strictly opposed to? Selfishness. What did Jesus tell His disciples? The first message we preached in this church, I will go back to it probably every time I preach. Leave. Go tell other people. You must preach it. They made Jesus known. They lifted up Christ. They proclaimed the kingdom. They pointed people to the Savior. Listen to me. Not their opinion. I've had multiple, this is ironic, I've had multiple people this week ask me about that privately. Had private conversations with individuals about the idea of people filling pulpits and not preaching the Word of God and calling it preaching. Uh, Listen, I care and I'll say it this way. That is not preaching. That is just speaking. Those are empty, fruitless words. They're fluff. They're lifeless. Isaiah the prophet said it's, it's like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces. That is the power of the Word of God. Not fluff. Not opinion. That is not what they came preaching. They made known the Word of God concerning the Son of God. That is the whole point of the text. And notice what happened in verse 18. People took notice what? at what the shepherds had told them. What did they tell them? The Word of God. Do you know why I think most churches are not heard in most of our countries in the world? I'm convinced it's because we're not saying anything worth listening to. If you will notice, every time in Scripture the Word of God was lifted up, a real revelation preached to people. You know what people always do? Stop and take notice. Jonah went into a foreign land, did he not? Preached to people that hated him. But when he lifted up the Word of God, what did the people of Nineveh do? Turned to God. 
when Elisha got on the mountaintop and everybody's talking and preaching and cutting themselves and calling out to their false gods, and then one man gave a word from the Lord and an entire group of people bowed. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. An entire nation of people bowed down to false idols. And three young teenage boys stood up and said, you know what, we have a better word. We have a better word. So much so that Nebuchadnezzar fell under great conviction at a fiery furnace. It is essential that you understand when the Word of God, the real Word of God, the revealed scriptural Word of God is lifted up, people will take notice. Because Romans 10 verse 17 says, So faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? And hearing by the Word of God. If you want your words to matter, Christian, start talking the Word to people. That's right. Hey, I like talking politics as much as anybody because Lord knows I've got an opinion. Amen. You ask Jordan, my Amen. goodness. Don't get me going. Don't get me going. And at the end of life, you know what they are? Meaningless. They're empty, fruitless conversations if they are not seasoned to the full with the Word of God. That is why Scripture says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against Thee. I didn't hide my opinion in here. I dwelt on the Word of God. That is what kept me in line. If you look at it even further, you think about it. The world doesn't need our opinion. The world doesn't need our politics. It doesn't need our preferences. It doesn't even need your advice. It desperately needs the Word of God. What did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Did you catch that? The Lord Himself said it would be better to be starving and full of the Word of God than to have full stomachs and satisfied appetites and not know God. What would it profit you to be full of the world and empty of the Word of God? I'll tell you what it would profit you. It would profit you eternity in hell. Because that is where that leads to for people. But a full Word from the Lord saturated in your mind and heart and soul. You know what that gets you? Life and godliness and eternity with the King. Verse 19 It says here, but Mary, in that same scene, as all this is happening, treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. What a, what a direct opposite of what just happened. The shepherds are out. They're loud. They're preaching. They're telling people. And now we have a woman who's not saying a word. Why is this also important? Because not only do you need to receive a revelation of it, not only do you need to obviously preach it, but friend, when you hear it, listen to me, it is vitally important that you meditate on it too. You have to. See, there's a lot going on here, not just for, for Mary, for anybody to comprehend. You don't just take this stuff lightly. You don't open the Word of God and just casually start flipping pages and reading text. That is not how this works. Scripture says that this is living and breathe. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. This thing has a life to it. As Adrian Rogers used to say, I read a lot of books, but the Bible's the only book that reads me. There's some depth to that. You know why? Because you have to meditate on it. It says she treasured them up and she pondered on these things. The Greek word there is symbolo. It, it literally means when you're talking about pondering, it means to combine something or literally to, to bring together in your own mind. It, it's the idea of like a puzzle that was poured out in front of you. What do you begin to do? Piece it together. There's something here. There is, as you and I would say, there's a big picture to all of it. And sometimes, friend, I think we miss the picture because we don't ponder on it. We just throw the pieces out on the table and say, well, I guess let's just see what happens. No, God said put the pieces together. Genesis wasn't an accident. Exodus wasn't an accident. 
Joshua, Judges, Ruth, Samuel, Kings, on down the line, the prophets of old, all the Gospels, the epistles keep going. It's not an accident. It works fluidly. It's one big picture. And listen to me. We have to. This is essential for a believer. You have to meditate on the Word of God. Don't just read on it. Think on it. Pray on it. Piece it together. Ask why. Ask what is going on. Look at the context of it all. What is Mary doing? What am I doing here? I I met with an angel recently and everything came to pass. Here are these shepherds. They came. They were not angry. They didn't even seem doubtful. They immediately went out and they started telling about this son that we have now. It's as if everything is working properly. Think on it this way. The plan of God is right even when it doesn't look right. That's what she's pondering. This is what she's treasuring up in her heart. Listen, you got to piece it together too, believer. When you get the bad diagnosis at the doctor, you got to piece that together with the Word of God. When you lose loved ones that are very close, you think, oh my goodness, what are we going to do now? you got to piece that together with the Word of God. When the world around you seems to be going to literal chaos... You have to piece that together with the Word of God. When things don't work out as you desire, when things that you've even prayed about do not come to pass as you ask, and God answers a different way, you have to piece that together with the Word of God. You have to meditate on this. I want to read you this passage very quickly. Psalms, number one actually. I would encourage you to almost memorize this. This is how you piece together the Word of God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. That's a nice way of saying, blessed is the man that doesn't live and listen to the world. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. Notice this. And on his law... He meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. Notice what happens when a tree is planted by water. Here's what it says. That yields its fruit in its season. You know what that means? You're never dried up. You're never unhealthy. The world will look at you. It says they'll scoff. They'll they'll make things known about your life. Oh, I can't believe that they listen to the Word of God, listen to His hearsay, this this trivial stuff. No, no, no. You are like a tree by water. You are constantly being fed if you meditate on the Word of God. Notice this. And its leaf does not wither. You don't run out. Jesus talked about continually that He was a well of living water. He never runs dry. This is the Christian. When they meditate on the Word of God, you don't run out dry. Notice what it goes on to say. In all that He does, being a spouse, being a parent, being a church member, being a worker, being a family member, being a citizen, you can name every little title you want to about your life. In all that He does, notice, He prospers. That does not mean possessions. That means you did well in every area of life according to the Word of God. You are, as the Scripture would say, you are well-pleasing to Him. You're a good and faithful servant. But the wicked are not so. They are like chaff that the wind drives away. If you ever wondered what happens when people don't meditate on the Word of God, you know what happens to them? The whirlwind of life. You ever taken chaff before, been out in a field somewhere and just kick up stuff, even like dandelions, and what happens when the wind's blowing? They're gone. In a matter of moments, aren't they? They're gone. It's as if they never existed. They were gone immediately. That is what happens when you don't meditate on the Word of God. Any little wind that comes along, you are taken by it. But people that meditate on the Word of God, you are like a tree planted by water. Play that story out, by the way, there in verse 19. What happens to that woman? 
You better be thankful that she meditated on the Word of God and she treasured it and she pondered on it because, friend, life is coming down hard on her. Where was Mary when Jesus was being crucified? A whole lot closer than most of the men that said, I'll follow you to your death. Amen? You know what, you know what we'd say about Mary? She never left the river of water. She stayed planted. You know what that means? She meditated on the words of her God. And she was not moved by the world. Yes, we hear the revelation of it. Yes, we preach it. Yes, we meditate on it. But verse 20, And the shepherds returned. Notice this. Were they disappointed that, oh, we didn't see a great move of God? No, they're pondering on it. Can I help you out? Salvation's of the Lord. You, I love you. You can't win anybody. I learned that the hard way when I first started preaching. Well, I thought, I'm gung-ho. I'm going to get up here and I'm going to lay it down and people are just going to flock to the altar. You know what happened? I've, honest statement, I've had very, very, very few people give their life to the Lord when I preach. Very few. Do you know why? Because I don't save anybody. God does. God has called me, God has called you to lift up your voice and make Christ known. He will do the saving. He will do the revealing. He will do the drawing. And He will also do the sealing. And He will also do the bringing home. You have one job. Be a messenger. You preach it, you go out there, you meditate on it, but notice this. They came back, and here it is, after you've meditated on it, because this is usually what the Word of God does when you let it richly dwell within you. The shepherds return, glorifying and praising God for all they had felt, for all they got out of it, for all their happiness, no, for all they had heard. Where did they hear it from? Where does all glorifying God come from? The Word of God. They heard it from where? Heaven. This is not invented somewhere in the middle of a field. The Word of God came to them. They heard it. And then what did God do? Very graciously. Most people don't get this, but they did. They got to what? They got to see it. They got to see it. Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. Though. He didn't have to show it to you. But if you've heard it, you have no more excuse. Hey, listen, I've never seen the resurrected Lord. And that's why Jesus tells me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe though, Jeremiah. You're still as blessed as those shepherds, even though I never showed myself to you. But you've heard it. You've heard it. All your life, kiddo, you've heard it. What's the proper response? It's been told to them. That's what it said. This has been told to you that you would hear it and see it. And what was their response to that? The proper response after it's been preached to you, after it's been meditated on, here it is. You also sing it. This is one of the most forgotten parts, in my opinion, of Christianity today. We don't like to sing it anymore. We like to hear it preached. We like to hear it sung by somebody else. But we don't like to open our mouth and ascribe worth to the Word of God. But notice what the shepherds did. They came back and glorified and praised God. How did they do that? Based on what they'd heard. They didn't do it based on their feelings. You know why? Because they're still shepherds. Did their livelihood change? No. Did they go from low class to high class just because they'd heard the work? No, they did not. They didn't get new clothes. They didn't get Christmas presents. Sorry. They didn't get more sheep. They didn't get a better field. They didn't get nicer staffs. Their life never really changed other than their eternity now. This is it, folks. You have to fixate your mind as a believer that this that you live in right now is extremely temporary. The Word of God says that our life is like a vapor. It appeareth for a little while and then vanisheth 
away. You are here for a minute moment in the grand scheme of eternity. It is but a blimp on the radar of your existence. You say, how long will we make it? Nobody in this room's promised the next five seconds. Much less five years or 50 if we get to live that long. Friend, listen to me. While you're here, you better ascribe worth to God. Because when you meet Him in eternity, you will bow down and ascribe worth to Him. But you may not get to do it for all of eternity. It is essential that we bow the knee now and we give glory to God for what we have heard and what we have seen and what we know to be true. Not because our life changed in the external experience. Not because we got more stuff. That doesn't mean anything. Jesus said, what would it profit a man to gain the whole earth and lose his own soul? What would that matter? If you got more stuff, they weren't looking for stuff. They needed a Savior. And they've got it now. And notice, they worship because of it. It's the natural response when God's revelation comes to us, listen to me, to ascribe worth back to God. Here's the last point, verse 21. And at the end of eight days, when He was circumcised, referring to Jesus, He was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before He was conceived in the womb. This next point, in all honesty, is the separator. This is it. This is the difference between somebody saying they are a Christian and God knowing that they belong to Christ. This is it. This is all throughout Scripture. Not only is it revealed to us and preached to us and we meditate on it and we sing it, but listen to me very carefully. If you don't do this fifth thing, it's irrelevant. You have to live it. You have to live it. To be saved? No, no, no. Because you are saved. It is a flowing out of doing this. Why did they take Him to be circumcised on the eighth day? Because Genesis verse 17, or excuse me, chapter 17, verse 12 said to You say, what does that mean? That means God said to. End of story. It is thus saith the Lord. Here's two young people. You know what they did? They didn't have a dime to their name. But you know what they had? Obedience. What the Scriptures tell us? Obedience is better than sacrifice. It would be better that you obeyed the Lord and had nothing to your name than give millions of dollars and not know Christ. You must obey and live out the Word of God. Not your felt experiences. Please crucify that in your life. Please, if you hear nothing else, crucify the idea that you're going to live out your truth or your felt experiences. That is demonic theology. You know why? Because it's man-centered. God-centered theology says this, we will live out what the Lord says to do. That will not be popular often. You will not be praised for that in this world. You will probably not be lifted up. Your name will probably not be known. And that's the point. Because guess who will be lifted up? Your Savior, Jesus Christ. Your only hope of heaven will be lifted up. And that is the point. They circumcised Him according to the Word of God. And then what else did they do? They obeyed Luke 1.31. What does Luke 1.31 say? And you shall call His name Jesus. You don't get the option, Mary and Joseph. You know what they said to that? Amen. Amen. Because that's what true believers do. They take God at His Word and they say yes to it. Well, they do. They call His name Jesus. Notice what the rest of the verse says. The name that was given by the angels before He was conceived in the womb. You know what that's called? A word from God. And they obeyed the Word of God. They lived it out. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love Me, you will keep My commandments. That is not a suggestion. That is not up for your experiences and your feelings. That is not up for some denominational tie. That is not up for some preference and opinion. Jesus said, if you love me, there is one way that we will know that. You will do what I say. 
You will live out the Word of God. James 2, verse 26, For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. You say, are you trying to tell me that we've got to work for our salvation? No, you work because you are saved. He said, that's hard to understand. Jesus said it. Jesus said that every good tree will bear what? Good fruit. Why? Because it has to. And He also said that bad trees cannot bear good fruit. You know why? Because good trees, Christians, will be Christ-like. They will obey God. The word. That is the telltale sign in your life, believer. Going to church, yes, that's good, but why? Because he said to. Don't forsake the assemblies of ourselves together. Forgiving other people, it's good, but why? Because he said to. Loving others, it's good, because he said to. Keeping your tongue, praying often, being humble, not being boastful, not being arrogant being kind to one another, meditating on the Word of God. Why are all those things good? Because He said they were. And He said for us to do those things. They're not just good pie-in-the-sky ideas that somebody came up with. They're the Word of God, and it's what we bow to. The text is very clear this morning. If we're going to go tell anything in the world today, it will be it. We must go tell it, and it is the Word of God. This is what we do. In this Christmas season, just like these shepherds, if we take anything from this text, it is this. We will go to a lost and dying world. We will tell them of it. We will tell them the Word of God. And listen to me when I say this next part as we close out. We will leave the consequences to God. Please get your mind on that. You must leave the consequences with God. Hey, listen, I have family members that I would love to see saved. I have family members that I've spoken to about the Lord, and they are right now not saved. You leave the consequences with God. I've had students ask me over the last few weeks things. I have a Bible on my desk and different things. You know, Mr. Ron or this, Mr. Ron or that. I'm not going to back off of that. So that could cost you your job. I will leave the consequences with God. I don't have another option. Because if I'm going to be a good tree and bear good fruit, I'm going to do what He says. It cost His disciples their life. That book you have in your hand that you're reading on your phone right now and scrolling, somebody died for that. Somebody died for that. We leave the consequences with God. We obey His Word. The reward for things well done on this earth and obedience is really simple. You get God forever. And what more could anyone ever want? More than possessions, more than power, more than fame, more than notoriety, more than everything you could think of. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what He has in store for His people that obey Him. You can't conceive of the reward that Christ has for people that say yes to His Word and no to the world. It will. We used to sing a song, it will be worth it after all. You've heard that before? Some of you older saints, stay with me here. Come on now, church people. It will be worth it after all. There's a lot of truth in that statement. But remember, that's after all. You have right now though. And you are required to obey the Word of the Lord. And you are required to be a servant of the Most High King. Even when sometimes He's in a trough, in the middle of nowhere, in a poor town, born to poor kids, with poor shepherds coming to visit. It may not look like the grandest thing right now, but remember, He still wears the crown. He still owns the throne. Heaven is still His. And the Word of God is the only truth you'll ever know. Amen? Put it together like Mary did. Piece it together. Meditate on it. Live it, believers. Amen? Let's go to Him in prayer.